Tom, it's great to have you on this morning. Thank you for being with me. Great to be here. Mark. 10 months ago, I had you on to discuss alternative investment strategies to traditional tax deferred investments. And a lot has happened in that 10 months. We've seen sudden hyperinflation, skyrocketing stock market, a hampered supply chain, and the Fed has been discussing raising interest rates and scaling back their quantitative easing. So there's a lot happening. And I wanted to get your thought about the economy in general and with regard to inflation and supply chain impacts, what do you think will happen here going forward? What are your general thoughts? Well, I think that few people really have a handle on it, no matter how much time they spend dissecting or looking at a given segment. I think uh, part of the U.S. economy, it depends who you talk to, and I will look at the left or the right. I won't get involved in it, but simply saying probably someone on the left is going to have a different take than someone on the right, especially with a different president in the White House. Now it's all his fault, okay? supply chain stuff that may go back a decade. It might involve two or three presidents of different parties. So it is divisive in that sense. Uh, there, I think, are strong indicators of our economy. Unemployment, although this last week it shot up due to Omicron, they say. The economy is strong. Uh, one big reason to the stock market, I'll time together a little bit, is because where else are you going to invest money? I'm talking about foreign. I mean, there's not a whole lot of places you want to invest money, especially big money. Mm -hmm. And people I don't see pulling out of 401ks, which accounts for about seven or eight trillion dollars. That's all in Wall Street. I don't see people pulling out of IRAs when the S&P set records and not last couple of days is down. But Wall Street, uh, the Dow, whatever is just all time highs. I don't see 12 trillion dollars leaving IRAs unless it's some really compelling reason, okay? So I think overall, the economy is strong. I think we're going to go into this year or we're in this year strong. I think it's going to remain strong. I think there's going to be certain things. Supply chain is one. Finding workers is two. Due to they just not wanting to do menial work anymore or not at eight or 10 bucks an hour. Uh, looking, maybe changing careers. I think the remoteness are being off and maybe unemployment, maybe not. has really opened the eyes of a lot of people saying, I don't have to work here. XYZ for 10 bucks an hour. Maybe I can do this or whatever. And some of them are side hustles. They could be cooking muffins and go sell them on the street. I don't know. Supply chain wise, I look at the building industry is when the building dropped and everything tanked, uh, a lot of your uh, lumber manufacturers, uh, your lumber mills, drywall, whatever, just shut down. They said, we're not going to be stuck with billions of dollars of inventory sitting here. And it was more like a speed bump or glitch. And then suddenly the economy started going again, including new houses. And now suddenly there's the shortage. And then always there's the people who will run in and clean out the instant coffee shelf at a market because they see doom and gloom and what have you. And so I, since we've talked, I think, and I could be wrong. I don't know if that's when toilet paper got up to five bucks a roll, but uh, what have you. But there's certain anomalies of testing the people. I think in a way we're better off for having gone through it now that we've gone through it. We've kind of seen the scare house, the boogeyman, whatever. We kind of know what they are or can be and maybe can adjust a little better on our feet financially, physically, mentally, whatever, to cope with what's going on. But I'm optimistic and I know we'll turn to real estate. Many industries are optimistic. Have you ever seen an era, I haven't, where used cars bring a premium? I mean, thousands over what they're normally worth. My wife and I had, had a car that was on a three-year lease. It came up, I think we owed 15000 And a couple of months before it was up, we were getting offers of 17000 for it. I've never heard of that. From outsiders, Carvana, whatever, of trying to buy that car. It's just, it was unheard of. Usually you're begging them to take it, okay? Right. <laughs> that type of situation. So the car industry is strong. They're trying to build as fast as they can. They are real estate market strong. I mean, strong as it's ever been. And the stock market's strong. There's just so many indicators. So where do you think we are in the economic cycle? Do you think we are, do you think we're still at the peak? Do you think that, the, do you think this peak is going to last for a while? Or do you think that we're, 
as as many pundits are saying that we're on we're on the precipice you know we're already over the cliff what's right your, what's your thought well, about that well of course i think people it's rosy and it's terrific and the people we're going over the cliff i happen to think that you and i are, are captaining a ship and our map has run out it's blank paper we're in uncharted waters we don't know where we are it may be 10 miles there's a fabulous country our land it may be a thousand miles where we make it provisions whatever so that's where i think we are we're really in uncharted the times are so different you can't match them with the past in all things okay some things at some times but not all things i don't think we're going over the precipice i think the naysayers caught this funk this gloom and i think a lot of it's political because most things they're griping about is tied to who's in power and I truly mean that. They don't say, oh, this has happened. Gas is all time high. They say, look what Biden's done. It's prefaced. It. And, and people had said, look what Trump did. I think that for naysayers, get off the, the sad sack thing. Start looking at the bright side, whatever. I think the stock market, we are nearing a peak. I, I've analogized with you before. You're at a child's birthday party. Someone's uh, blowing up a balloon. It's getting bigger and bigger. It's squeaking. People are getting nervous. Is it going to pop? And the guy keeps huffing and puffing. I don't know. Will it crash? Will it tumble? People lose their shirts? No, I don't think so. But could it drop 25, 30, 40 percent? Yeah. The S&P has dropped 38 percent in the last 25 years. You know, there were times. So what goes up can come down. I would not have all my eggs in one basket. I would not have it all in real estate. I would not have it all in Wall Street. And I would not have it all in a, a CD or money market account or in a coffee can under the bed. You know, I would truly diversify. So let's talk about real estate. What's going on in real estate right now? I can hear from someone from Seattle one day, uh, from New York City, and then from Tulsa. It happens all the time. Talking about maybe they're trying to exchange a property, what have you. And so I have at least, uh, I think, an inkling of, of what's going on. Real estate is and always has been regional. You may say, woe is me where you are. Your house has been in the market for three months, no action. Uh, and somewhere else, sold my, like you see on TV, the ad, sold my house in one day. Well, he's in an area, obviously, with at a premium. He uh, probably has a product that people want. It's not a dump or a tear down. And he probably priced it right. Guess what? I think real estate is strong. I still see here in most parts of the country. I just had a couple of closings in uh, Phoenix, Arizona with a doctor client. And I'm here in Key West, Florida. And I never saw the homes, whatever, put the deals together. But there were multi-offers on it. You got into an escalation clause. Can you have contingency? Seller willing to do it. You get into inspection reports. Uh, will they help pay for some of the seller? And then in Florida here, I know for a fact, it's commonly multi-offers over asking price. The seller's saying, I don't want contingencies if they can get it. The seller's asking for a pre-approval and not pre-qualification. Pre-approval means that you've been underwritten, okay? Pre-qualification means you know a banker and he says, Mark's worth a million dollars. We'd loan him a million and it's, it's worthless, okay? Pre-approval means we've looked at his tax returns, his W-2s, his paycheck stubs, his debt to income ratio. We've basically done a cursory overview, but it's a lot more depth than just saying Mark looks like he's a good guy, what have you. So it's a seller's market. It's going to remain the B1, although I have to emphasize on MLS, and I'm privy to several of them in the country, almost every day I get MLS notifications of price reductions. If a house was red hot and worth every penny, then why did it sell? Typically, the reason is overpriced. Admit it or not, most realtors sit down and say, well, Mark, my comp show your house is worth $750. Well, I don't think so. I think it's worth $895. Okay, we'll list it for $895. They just go along with the will of the people. And if they don't uh, tighten up a little or be a little bit realistic or a little bit of trying to bring you into reality, yours will be $8.95 and suddenly three months later, it's eight forty five, and then it's eight fifteen, dollars And maybe eventually it gets down to seven ninety five, dollars where it should have been in the first place. And this is created, I think it's interesting. I sit down with you and I'm just using your house, Mark, as an example. It may be worth a million five or three fifty. 
Yeah, I doubt that. Anyway, I sit down with you and say, we shade 795 is a magic number. I might look at you and say, let's make it 745. You know, what? And I say, because what we're going to do is invite bidding, a frenzy, where suddenly they start coming in at full price, 10,000 over, 30,000 over. There is a certain psychology to that. And in many cases, it works. Okay. A lot of houses I've seen being sold today, too, unless you just have a house that looks like a model, is it's not cluttered up with your bowling trophies and all those things. And your Michael Jordan jersey on the wall, you know, that type of thing, which most people don't care about, is staging. It's, it's never done better of staging the house. So even if staging means to you, you list your house, get rid of this, get rid of the bowling trophies, you know, things like that, clean it up whatever. I also see coming through too, which indicates a slowing seller's market is open houses. Six months ago, they were unheard of. No one had a sign that said open house. Today, they're common. I probably get three to four notices a day of an open house during the weekend. And you can also tell the tempo when they're saying sushi, champagne, catering versus uh, uh, a box of uh, rye crisp and some Kool-Aid or something like that, whatever. They would say, why would I waste my time? I recently saw a house here for a million six. It's one of the nicest homes I've seen. It had uh, the 60 foot of seawall. It's on a canal. It's just a fabulous house. And he didn't list with me. I thought he might, but he took so many. He's known for 23 years, which happens. And uh, it's still on the market two months later. So the only inference I can draw, unless there's something unbeknownst to me, it's overpriced. And I thought his price was right on and it's not selling. So that tells you something. So I think it's strong. I think interest rates will tick up, maybe push four during this year, maybe a tad over. But folks, I remember when a good credit, you paid 14%. So don't get in this delusion that it's going to drop down or plummet down. If it does refi, don't hang in there. Suddenly it's four and a half and you wait now it's five, five and a half, six. I think eventually it will go up several points in a year, maybe a year or two. But Mark, if you have a $500,000 mortgage and you take a 3.75 versus a 5.75, it can amount to a hundred thousand or more during the life of the loan just that indecision. So, and a house is last year, 2021, averaged well over 10%. I think the national average was 14% appreciation. So my doctor client, I said to him, I said, you have a stock account with 630,000 and a brokerage account, and now it's worth 659. So in one year, okay, you made that, 620, I think, you made 39,000. I said, if you would have bought the house, I suggested, at 500,000, 15% appreciation would have went up 75,000. Plus you could depreciate it, rent it, whatever. So it gets you thinking. You mentioned the stock market just a moment ago. Let's talk about the stock market. It's been crazy high. Mm -hmm. And what's your thought on the stock market these days? And what do we do with our Wall Street based holdings like 401ks? IRAs, okay. et cetera. Well, first of all, I minimum would look at it like you and I are at a crap table in Vegas and you put down 5,000 and now you got 15. I'd say, Mark, drag the five out, put it in your pocket. Now your maximum exposure is you'll lose 10 and you'll be even. In fact, I think, Mark, why don't you drag out 10 and start with the five you have? It's all house money. So Mark, if you had 30,000 in your S&P last year at the beginning and it closed in 2021 at you had 30,000 in it at 60, I probably would pull 25,000 out, 30,000 out and look to do something else with it. Okay. Uh, candidly, I think uh, it has a strong chance of going down dramatically. I probably would start looking at, depending on how much there is, taking a large chunk of it out and moving it over to real estate. It's probably investment real estate. Probably you don't have it. I don't think it'll sustain itself. I think it's going to go down and I think it'll happen this year. You, you think that this year we'll see a decline in the stock market? Yeah, I won't say a crash, but I think, uh, yeah, I definitely don't think the S&P last year at the beginning of 2021 was 3,000. It closed like at 4,650. You know what? I, you know, do the math. That's almost, uh, what, a 60% increase? So if you had 100,000, you got 160. 
Okay, I don't think it's going to do that again. Now, I could be all wrong. It's ultimately your call. But if all you have, Mark, is your, your money tied up 401k, IRA, in the stock market, I, I beg you to take a look around and think about it. And, and we'll discuss it more at length sometime, maybe in other blogs, the IRA versus the 401k versus none of them, whatever. Diversify. That's what Wall Street says. Of course, its meaning is pick our menu. Okay, <laughs> whatever. Stay in our restaurant, pick from our menu. It isn't, oh, what do you mean you want Chinese food? Whatever, do something different. It's diversify. Start looking at how can you diversify. 401k company is basically the employee putting money away, a predetermined amount. It's painless. It's done normally payroll deduction and a third party, the administrator of the company is typically a third party that was uh, beholden to Wall Street because the administrator that recent companies like this, they have 3,000 employees. They don't have to do the paperwork. The administrator does it all. Well, let me tell you, uh, any of your major mutual funds are there uh, drooling to take the action and they put you in their favorite account. And often you look at like this doctor friend, he made about 3%. Pathetic. In, in one of the biggest years ever. So uh, look at what you have. Maybe you should do some uh, some changing of assets or getting out of it altogether. And let me add one thing on that, if I can, is many, many, many economists, it can always be contrary. Many, many economists have said that most P and E ratios do not stand up under typical traditions or scrutiny. They're overvalued. They're overblown. Instead of 10 to 1, they're 40 to 1 or 100 to 1. Of course, sheepishly, I admit, so was Amazon the first year or two. <laughs> it was so overvalued. It's incredible. Now you wish you had 100,000 shares. So if a person is considering real estate in this yes. market as an investment, is it wise to buy now while there are bidding wars going on and things like that? Or should we wait uh, a little bit until prices have cooled a little? That is, to me, a real conundrum. I don't know the answer. I mean, I just don't feel comfortable just absolutely saying buy or don't buy, sit on the fence. So much of it depends on you. For example, if you and your wife were going to buy here in Key West in five years, that was your, your plan. You're both retiring. You know, you, you got your pension, whatever, selling your house, whatever you're going to do. And you saw a house down here you loved. I, I would encourage you to buy it because I do think in five years, it'll be worth more, more importantly, it may be gone, you know, that ideal house. All things are not expensive or are necessarily negative cash flowing properties for investment, but that might mean you go out of your comfort zone. That may mean that you don't invest in Key West or Phoenix, where my doctor lives, doctor client. It may mean going to Atlanta or Columbus, Ohio, or something and getting an older brick duplex and your IRA paying 90000 all cash. And now it has cash flow. Maybe the cash flow is eight, 900 a month versus come down here for 90000 I couldn't show you a lot. I couldn't show you a single white old trailer. So are you willing to go outside the box? That's something Wall Street has been brilliant at in marketing and structuring. A mutual fund brings it to you on your couch. Pfizer may be in another state than you, but it isn't the point. Stock is available anywhere, in any state for sure. Dot, dot, dot. Where real estate, that may not be the case. Because you imagine sitting in your living room and the guy is saying, well, I could sell you Pfizer at 30 a share. But you live in your state, it's 90. And my analogy is Tulsa, Oklahoma versus Key West or Los Angeles, San Francisco, whatever. And you go, what? That's outrageous. I have people down here that will pay a million dollars for a house and it just doesn't investment, doesn't pan out. But they have the money and it's like monopoly to them. They don't care. They want boardwalk. They want to buy something now, a trophy maybe or something they should enjoy using and having the family use that really depends on the investment it's uh, where what's your level of comfort and how much do you have but to start thinking about it i don't care if you have twenty five thousand in your ira i have nothing to sell you but maybe start educating yourself by the time you get 35 or 50 or 70 or maybe combining your ira with your company 401k dot i mean there's other things we need to look at it might be a HELOC in your house, maybe, but I'm simply saying, 
Once we pool all those, then can you buy that duplex, the single family home? There are, for example, single family homes that will break even with five to 15% down in Alabama, certain areas of the country are brand new, four bedroom, three bath, uh, 3,100 square feet, just beautiful brand new homes that you could rent for 2,500, 3,000. So it would break even. So we don't have to get into, oh, it's an old tear now, but you're not going to get that brand new home in Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, you know, they dream on. It's not going to happen. Would you ever suggest that people pay down their primary mortgage? Yes. I think if you were just headstrong on you're going to maintain your 401k, you got matching funds and someday we'll do LERP, life insurance, okay, retirement program. We'll do a whole blog on it, maybe with some illustrations. But that aside for the moment, let's say you're putting 500 into your 401k and not getting matching funds. And you took that 500 every month and put it on your mortgage payment. Would you pay it off in 12 years, 16 years, 18 years? What would that save you? That might save you. Let's say you're going to, on 30 years, you'd end up paying 300000 on that loan. Let's say you saved 100000 Can you honestly say that that account will make you 100000 in 30 years, and then you still got tax on it when you take it out of your 401k? So there are circumstances I could see that. Uh, another blog we should do someday is reverse mortgages. Because you're too young, but you might be of the age, you got a nice, healthy 401k, but you might also, your house is worth seven and you're 62, you can borrow 50% on a reverse mortgage. You borrow 375, your mortgage is 370, you pay it off, you now have a reverse mortgage, you never make a payment again. Would that help you retire? Of course it would. And your kids will inherit the house if they want. Or they can sell it when you pass. And let me tell you, I can see your face is kind of, and hmm, what do you mean? I was sitting on a bus bench at the uh, Key West Airport waiting for my wife to pick me up. I had, I had been at a real estate conference. And a guy next to me, we're chatting. And he said, you live here? And I said, oh, yeah, three years. And he said, wow, I've been down here a few times with the wife. And uh, we love it. And I said, well, you better be careful. You're going to end up looking at real estate. And he said, we already have. He smiled. And I said, where do you live? And he said, Ohio. So we talked a bit and it was determined his house in Ohio. He said, it's just not big bucks like down here, but they owned it. They would probably walk away with 500,000. Now follow me closely. He's over 62 years old. So he qualifies for a reverse mortgage. He said, and I'm down here looking at 500,000 up to 500,000. And I said, then you haven't found anything. He said, that's true. I mean, it's just two bed and one bath, you know, not built in the 1940s, needs work, whatever. It's just, it's, it's depressing. I said, well, what if I, you don't want payments, right? No, no, we come down here, no payments. I said, what if I could double your budget a million? You can start looking at houses up to a million with no payments. He says, well, yeah, how would you do that? I said, a reverse mortgage, use your 500,000, you find a million dollar house, you put it down, you take a reverse mortgage for 500,000, you have no payments, and now you're in a million dollar house. Would that open up your high horizons? He said, I can't believe that. He said, I don't, I'll, my realtor never brought that up. And I will scold realtors, if nothing else, for a higher commission and to better serve the person. Now, it's not for everyone, and we'll go into that someday, a reverse mortgage, but I provide solutions. I think that's why they reach me well in real estate. I'm talking about working with realtors and clients. I try to provide solutions, not just, oh, I can list your house and we're the biggest and the best and get you the most money. It's, what do you want to do? What are you going to do with it, Mark? So I'm simply saying to you, that's an example of uh, utilizing something, uh, for looking at it from a different slant. In your mind, what does the ideal portfolio look like? Well, uh, by the way, so your audience knows I was a Smith Barney stockbroker. I did pass the Series 7 exam. I know enough to be dangerous. I, I just kind of chuckle when I see the charts. Well, you're 4% cash mark and you're 8% money market and you're 12% in municipal bonds and all the yada, yada, yada. But, but Mark, the menu's all Wall Street. It's rare. In fact, when I do presentations, Mark, for realtors, I have a chart just like that, which is what comprises the ideal portfolio. 
And ironically, the 100% adds up to all slices of Wall Street product. Then I have the same chart, same amount of blue, orange, red, yellow. And the yellow may be duplex. And the blue is a triplex, whatever. And then, of course, there's cash, money market account, you know, things like that. Maybe an IRA, maybe a 401k, maybe a stock brokerage account. And I say, look at this. What's different? And they had to look at it for a moment and say, wait a minute, there's real estate in that portfolio. So to me, it would be the first crossroad you come to is get out of 100% Wall Street and park some of your money into real estate. So that would be the ideal portfolio. And I don't mean your personal house. That's a start. But I mean, investment real estate. Hey, guys, thanks for watching and listening. Hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. And check out some of these other clips from the podcast.